this service teaches us a wonderful lesson about praising the Lord. Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show my salvation. I like that German translation a little better. Wer dank opfert, der preiset mich. Und da ist der Weg, dass ich ihm zeige das Heil Gottes. He means to say that our thanksgiving opens a way into the treasury of Jehovah and makes it possible for God to make us appreciate and receive all his blessings. And when the Lord Jesus said, Remember, this do in remembrance of me, he opened the treasury of his grace, and he wants us to come to the communion table to remember all, not only all that he's done for us, but all that he is to us. He shall see of the travail of his soul when he is able to manifest and communicate himself in all his holiness, in all his majesty, in all his fullness to us, and not before then. And so tonight we come to this wonderful table of the Lord with grateful hearts, with thanksgiving. Why don't we thank God more? I remember one certain minister who told his people, don't praise the Lord unless you feel like it. It was after I had taught him to praise him at all times. And so he tried to tear down what I had said. He says, why should I praise the Lord when I don't feel like it? What shall I praise him for? Oh, beloved, that's unbelief. That puts the devil on the throne. The Bible tells us that we ought to give thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. It's done. This wonderful covenant which God wants to ratify again among us tonight makes available to us all that Jesus Christ died for and all that his precious blood purchased for us. He hath made us acceptable in the Beloved. He hath made us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And, O oh God, I pray that by the power of the Holy Ghost, Thou wilt anoint our eyes with thy salve. Thou wilt give us the understanding what is the exceeding greatness of Thy inheritance in the saints, that we may not only be happy and not only be thankful, but that we might be in faith tonight to receive all that God has for us. Our brother spoke of the wonder of a communion service and how that God Almighty makes wonderful offers. Well, he does. Listen. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And when he says this too in remembrance of me, he wants us to be conscious and to be recipients of his blessing. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. And what are his benefits? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. And I know that Jesus Christ is here tonight to do all that for everyone that needs help. To forgive every sin and every transgression that's brought to him. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he's here to heal from every disease and from every sickness and every pain. That's not only God's plan, but it's something he has done. The lamb has been slain. The ransom price has been paid. And God wants us to discover what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who to believe. God has to call us to remember these blessings. Remember how in Romans 6 he says, Don't you know, don't you remember that you were baptized into Jesus Christ? How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Don't you know what God did for you when he gave Jesus Christ his son to die for your sins and when he raised him again for your justification? And don't you remember that you were baptized into that same Jesus Christ that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also. We also. I was 
amusedly interested in what Brother Gardner said this morning about a holy beach. We also, whether you're on the beach, whether you're up in the air, whether you're down, down below the sea or anywhere you are, we also should walk like Jesus Christ walked in newness of life. We also should walk in newness of life. Glory to God. The Bible says, And you that were dead in trespasses and sins, don't blame the world for living the way they do. And don't blame worldly Christians for being slaves to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. They can't help it. They're dead. All of humanity is like a big corpse, the Bible says. All flesh, even theological and religious flesh, is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. It fadeth, it's cast into the oven, and all flesh is dead in trespasses and sins, and the maggots walk away with this corpse. And the Bible says we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. We had no other hope but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. And since we know that one time we walked like that, we don't blame the world, and we don't blame worldly Christians. How could we? We would all be like that, but for the great love wherewith he loves us. God's done something for us. Thank God. That's salvation in comparison to what people call religion. Oh, how dead can religion be without the power of God? Having a form of God in it satisfies a lot of people. Going to church, singing songs going through the rigmarole of baptism and communion service and getting nothing from God. That's why Jesus Christ says, this do in remembrance of me until I come. There is a wonderful bridge between the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ and his coming again. Hallelujah. He has raised us up together. And may Rabbi Albaza made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And tonight, beloved, everything depends what we do with God's offer. Here is the offer. This is my body broken for you. The church has for centuries fought over that doctrine. Is it or isn't it? Beloved, we don't fight. We eat it. And we drink it. And we know that this is my body broken for you. It's as potent and it's as powerful as God Almighty could possibly make it to the heart that receives it in faith. As many as received Him, to them gave He power. Child of God, you need power. Amen. You need glory Amen. to God. Not power to cast out devils and heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse the leper. But you need His power to subdue, to get you down to cleanse you, to give me humility, to give you purity of heart. I need a powerful king in my heart. One time Satan reigned over my will and over my affections, and how many dear Christians have never surrendered their will to Jesus Christ. They wouldn't even think of it. Beloved, I've been called all kinds of names. I've been called a carp and a narrow-minded bigot and all that sort of stuff. All you have to do is preach the gospel. The Garibadili Gailobadar calls the beggar from the dunghill and says, if you keep on eating those worms, smooth and woolly ones, you'll die. You don't have to abide on that manure pile. You don't. God Almighty has built for you a palace. He's got a crown of glory for you. He has for you a new heart. And he has for you a right spirit. His own spirit, hallelujah. And he's got for you a king of glory. And he'll take his great power and reign as soon as you give him the permission to do so. Oh, that's gospel. And why does he say that he's coming again in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Beloved, Jesus Christ is here tonight to ratify with us the eternal covenant but it's a two-way street. He ratifies it. And he expects me to ratify it. 
He offers it to me, and he expects me to take it, to receive it by faith. Oh, dear Lord Jesus Christ, how we forget all your benefits. Why is it we don't get acquainted with them? I believe I told you about a young man in France, in the city of Gate. All this happened maybe 50 or 60 years ago. And one day, the postman brought him a letter from America, an officially stamped letter. And he was supposed to pay one franc and 20 centimes for postage, which was missing. And he looked at that letter and said, that's from America. I bet that's from my uncle. I never had anything to do with him. Here, take it back. I'm not going to pay one franc and 20 centimes for that letter. Take it back. So they took it back. What was in the letter? An offer of a great fortune of about $200 million. His uncle had gone to America years ago and made a great fortune. And so did his brother. His brother died first. His brother was a multimillionaire. And he willed his millions to his brother. And when the second brother died, the government of the United States of the certain state looked for heirs. And they found that this young man was the only heir to this great fortune. And so they sent him an official letter offering to him this tremendous fortune. And he lost it all because he wasn't willing to pay a few pennies postage. Beloved, we lose it all if we do not come to Jesus Christ tonight in real faith and accept him in the way he, he gives himself to us. This too in remembrance of me, O oh my Jesus, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Beloved, it's an accomplished fact. It's in this inheritance. He that was rich became poor, that by his poverty we might be rich. And if he had only preached the gospel to us and given us only this wonderful book, this New Testament, it would have been wonderful. But he also asks us to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Thank God. And oh, what a wonderful ratification of God's covenant is baptism. I wonder how people dare to trifle with the thought of baptism and how the church dares to trifle with it. How is it that they dare? It was not instituted by the Pope nor by any preacher or evangelist, but by Jesus Christ. They say it was his last command. No, it was his first command after he received all power in heaven and in earth. Hallelujah. Power to give eternal life to as many as receive him. He says it's finished. All power is mine. The devil has lost his power. He has abolished death. He has destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And this life is in the Son of God. And you can't have it any other way but by receiving him. By coming out from among them. Come out from among the tombs. Come into this wonderful realm of eternal life. Come into this open ark of the covenant. Thank God. And so he says, remember, in Psalm 103, all his benefits. When, when we received an inheritance, some woman had left thousands of dollars for the Ridgewood Pentecostal Church, and that was God. A year before, I said, now next year we have our 25th anniversary, and we're going to burn the mortgage. We had taken up $20,000 to fix up the church. And so the brethren said, well, we better get out a mimeograph letter and make a plea for money. I said, we'll do nothing of the sort. God has paid all our bills up to now, and we're not going to dishonor God by unbelief. I remember the goo-goo eyes they made at me. They thought, well, you'll see. I did see, thank God. In the meantime, a woman who had been in our meeting only three times died. And before she died, she willed her thousands to the Ridgewood Pentecostal Church. And when a letter came from a lawyer, I said, what in the world does he want? Well, here was the offer of all this money. And you know, a will is hard to read. There are paragraphs, first and second and third. And then there are uh, clauses that are printed in fine letters. But here, I was deeply interested when the original Pentecostal Church was named as the beneficiary. That was different. My heart leapt within me, praise God, 
And so we were able to pay off our mortgage. And you remember that night how our chorus, our uh, choir under the leadership of Mrs. Gardner sang the Hallelujah Chorus while I burned that mortgage on the platform. I believe Handel turned around in his grave. He never heard his Hallelujah Chorus sung just like that under the unction of the Holy Ghost. It was done. God wants us to sing songs of praises, hallelujah, but he doesn't want us to curb his grace, but he wants us to receive the fullness of it, all that he has purchased for us. Thank God. We cannot satisfy him any other way. That's the very principle of faith, that you know that God is when you come to him. And when you come to God, you come to receive something. And what do you come to receive? Why the New Testament, the provisions of the New Testament? Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. And there's not a single person in this place or in the whole world that has any business to stoop any longer to the slavery of sin or flesh or devil. You don't have to. Sin shall not rule over you. Sin shall not be able to enslave you any longer. Thank God, he that abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. With what desire, Jesus said, have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I know that this night, if your heart is hungry for him, his great heart is more hungry for you. That's what he died for. I can't comprehend it. I said, my God, how is it possible that you think of me a poor scrub among two billion people in the world and billions that have already gone into eternity? And shall I be able to claim all these promises of God? Listen, he died for all, thank God. And he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That word all includes me and you and no matter what other people do in the world. Oh my God, tonight I want to remember. Oh, I want to call my own heart to remember what you have done for me and what you are to me and what you're going to be to me tonight. As I eat thy flesh and drink thy blood, you will communicate to me life, your own divine holy life. Thank God. And though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And there are so many provisions in that covenant. I talked about this at a communion service in Stuttgart one Sunday morning. And God was wonderfully present. And I'd hardly gotten through when one got up and another got up and another got up. And they all had gotten a life when I told them not only the forgiveness of your sins, but the healing of your body. The same Christ who was delivered for our offenses, also took our sicknesses. And it was wonderful to me to hear the testimonies. One woman had had cancer. She was healed right in the meeting. Another one had had adhesion. She had suffered intense agony. She was healed. After a few months, I came back there and asked the pastor, how is it with those people that were healed that morning? She says, oh, they're still coming. She said, last week a man came to me and he said, do you see something? I said, what? Well, you see that I'm not walking on crutches anymore? <laughs> he also had been healed. What is God going to do for you? Listen, you don't have to ask that. Say, what has he done for me? He spared not his own son. He did. Glory to God. Is he going to forgive your sin? Is he going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness? Is he going to sanctify you wholly? Is he going to clothe you with the garment of righteousness and holiness? Is he going to heal your body? How could he help us when he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all? Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. But as I said, there are two ways to it. There's something else we ought to remember. He says, so let every man examine himself. You know, our brother Danny spoke of it this morning, I think, or sometime recently. How thoughts and feelings defile the temple of God as you've done to the least of these, my brethren. You've done it unto me, Jesus Christ says. That's why many are sick. 
and sickly, and many have died before their time because you don't discern the Lord's body. You don't realize that this covenant is a two-way affair. Not only God gives me Jesus Christ, but he wants me for a living sacrifice, for a temple that he might dwell within me and that rivers of living water might flow from within me and I might show forth the praises of him that has called me out of darkness into his marvelous life. Jesus. And what does he say when you so sin against the brethren? Beloved, I'm afraid there's a lot of that kind of sin that we don't even recognize. And because we don't recognize it, we fail to get the blessing. The light's gone. The candlestick has been removed. And tonight God wants us to have a great blessing by entering in upon his will and examining ourselves. When I was in Switzerland in 1933, a dear pastor had an American car and he wanted to take me to the mountains. As a boy, I didn't have the money to travel. I didn't see Switzerland when I was a boy except the little corner where I was born. So I was very anxious to go with him. He wanted to take me right into the snow-capped mountains And so he got his car started, and we went a few blocks, and it stopped. It wouldn't go another inch. And he looked at it, he opened the hood, and he danced around it and wondered what to do, and that car just wouldn't move. So he got a mechanic to haul it into his shop, and mind you, three or four Swiss mechanics worked at that thing for about two hours. Before they started, I said to my brother, say, I know what's the matter with that car. I happen to know it was an Auburn. And I happen to know that it's either the gas line or the ignition, one or the other, when it doesn't go. And in this case, it wasn't the ignition, it was the gas line. And I said, there's a little sieve in your gas line that is supposed to catch the dirt. And when that gets filled with dirt, the gas doesn't go through. If you'll just take that little sieve out and blow it out, your car will go fine. He said, oh, go on. What are you giving me? You're a preacher. You're not a mechanic. And so these four Swiss mechanics, I still see them. How they took their monkey wrenches and their hammers and their files and their torches and they worked at it. And they spoiled my trip. Absolutely. And after two hours, they listened to me. And they looked at that gas line, really. There was that little sieve, and it was full of dirt, and that's all that was necessary. And the car went, but the time was gone, too. Oh, beloved, it's the gas line, that power of God. You can pray from now until doomsday for a revival if you don't blow that dirt. It may be so little you don't even think of it. Listen, we have a song that we often sing at communion service in German. Oh, mein Jesus, lass mich nie vergessen. Meine Schuld und deine Huld. My Lord, don't let me forget. He says, forget not all his benefits. But now in this song we say, don't let me forget the abundance of your grace and the abundance of my guilt. Oh, that's it. The abundance of thy grace who forgiveth all thine iniquities. You remember that parable of the king to whom a man was brought who owed him Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now you can count it up if you have a good concordance. It may be more. It isn't less. Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars is a lot of money, and he owed that to the king, and the king ordered him to be given to the tormentors to make him work hard until he paid that debt. And what did he do? Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. He couldn't possibly pay it. He fell on his face. He begged mercy. And the king was merciful and forgave him that entire debt. Isn't that what Jesus has done to me? Isn't that what he does every day? For in many things we offend all. And we think that by just saying, oh Lord, forgive me, it's all right. Just wipe your mouth and say, I've done nothing. And beloved, we allow that thing to get into our gas line and to stop the power of God. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If ye forgive not from the heart other people their transgressions and their faults, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Beloved, we ought to search our hearts tonight in the presence of this wonderful Savior who has forgiven us this great debt. And what happened to that servant? He went out and he wasn't out the house yet. When he met another fellow servant who owed him ten cents, 
And he grabbed him by the Adam's apple and he choked him. He said, will you give me that money or there'll be a duel with stick and sword tonight? How many have you got by the throat tonight? Oh, you wouldn't on the outside. Oh, no, we're smiling at one another. But all oh, these thoughts, these feelings. Oh, to be transparent, beloved, God says that we have purified our souls unto unfeigned love of the brethren through the Spirit. Unfeigned love of the brethren. See, that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. That's what the love of Jesus Christ does. That's what he demands of the members of his body. And oh, how stingy we are and how we allow to, to have things crowd into our hearts when our brother spoke about carrying around things. I met a woman in Germany and she came apologetically. She apologized to me. She said, I've had bad feelings against you for a whole year. I said, and what did I do? Why, she said, you didn't shake hands with me. Well, the Germans have a habit of shaking hands with you. You may have your arms full of eggs and they'll come and, and they expect you to shake hands with them, they'll stick their fingers into your ribs, if you don't. <laughs> and sometimes I've just not done it. I've just walked away. No feeling at all. For a whole year. A whole year. Whoa, man. <laughs> Beloved, how many do you have by the gargle today? <laughs> Oh, what a blessing to have a forgiving heart because you've forgiven me. Oh, my God, how can I help but think well of everybody else? How can I help but reach out a helping hand to my fallen brother instead of knocking him down? My first year in Switzerland, someone wrote me a letter about a brother that had badly backslidden. And it was full of accusations. And I looked to the Lord and he made me sit down and write a loving letter to this brother. Not mentioning anything about backsliding at all. Just taking for granted that he was going on with God. It saved him immediately. If I had reprimanded him, he would have just hardened his heart. But love covereth the multitude of sins. I'm so glad that you and I don't have to judge anybody. We don't. He is the judge, thank God. And oh, how clean... How pure is the heart when it is free from all such feelings and thoughts. And Jesus Christ has really conquered your heart. That's what he means. When he says, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Oh God, let me not forget tonight your great love and mercy that has not spared your own son, but delivered him up for me. When I was a sinner, when I was an enemy, thank God. And now... Oh, to purify my soul through the Spirit unto unfeigned, transparent love for the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. We forget that communion means that very thing, that God calls us to task. How is it? Let a man examine everybody else. Not in the field. So let a man and woman too examine himself. Beloved, as I said, we can go through all the rigmarole of Pentecostal blessings. Here is the blessing. Blessed are the pure in heart. And that's what purity of heart means. It means that I have turned it over to Jesus Christ. I've examined myself. Oh, we're too careless about repentance. And the this dirt, it gathers in our souls and we don't know it. Years ago, before I got to the East, I had some touches with people. I had a very, very bad boss. And I, I, I did everything in my power to get that thing out of my heart. It made me sort of sour. And I had wonderful victories. But every time I saw this person, there was a bondage there. I smiled. I said, Hello? I spoke with him, but inside it wasn't, it wasn't right. There was something on the inside that wasn't me. It was from the power of darkness. That's what happens when we don't carefully 
walk in the Spirit. Oh, Jesus, take it. This is my body. Drink ye all of it. We are all members of that body of Christ. And before we enter upon the enjoyment of communion, everyone ought to examine himself. Look what the world does. I think it was Dr. Barnhouse that told about a certain uh, nuclear plant where they discovered that one-fiftieth part of an ounce of plutonium had been lost. I don't suppose you could see that. I suppose you could get that under your fingernail. Such a small amount was lost, and they knew it was deadly radiation that emanated from that little bit of plutonium. What did they do? Why, they raised the whole plant. It cost them $350,000 to get that thing cleaned up. Every worker in that place had to undergo a very careful medical checkup. And the floors had to be ripped up and replaced. And the roofs had to be scraped. And the walls had to be scraped. And the grounds for many acres around that building had to be dug up to the depth of a yard. And the stuff had to be carried away and dumped someplace where it couldn't do any harm. That's the way the world repents. They know the result. Jesus says, if we live in the flesh, we shall die. That's the matter. Beloved, that's why God cannot manifest his glory more powerfully among us. Maybe I am the fellow, the non-conductor. Maybe I am that piece of dirt that holds the flow of the power of God up. And someday we're going to give an account to him who is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Beloved, he's done it all. Oh, my Jesus, let me knee for guessing mine is shoulder and tiny holes. Don't let me forget my great guilt. Let me remember how much it cost you to save me, to deliver me from sin, to bear my iniquities and my sickness. My God, and I'll never trifle with sin again. I know that if I sin willfully, I crucify the Son of God afresh. And so tonight as we come to this sacred table of the Lord, oh God help us, God help me, God help us all to examine ourselves thoroughly and see. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, will cleanse us like we've never been cleansed before.